must have been about 12. I was hunting around for something interesting to look at. There was plenty of interesting stuff. With every death, a pile of new objects appeared in our apartment, deposited just as they were, trapped in a sudden end state because their previous owner, the only person who could have freed them, was no longer amongst the living. The contents of grandmother's last handbag, her bookshelves, buttons in a box. Everything had simply stopped like a clock on a particular hour of a particular day. So many objects like this in our house. And then one day I found an old leather wallet in a far drawer. It contained a single photograph. I could see straight away what sort of picture it was. Not a picture or a postcard or, say, a picture calendar. A naked woman lay on a divan, looking at the camera. It was an amateur shot, taken long ago, already yellowing with age. But the feelings it aroused in me were utterly unlike the way great-grandmother's Paris letters or grandfather's jokey poems had made me feel. The woman lying on the leather sofa was not beautiful. My sense of aesthetics had been formed by the cast gallery in the Pushkin Museum and a book on ancient Greek myth. I was affronted by her many bodily defects. Her legs were shorter than they were supposed to be and her breasts smaller, but her bottom was much larger and her tummy podgy in a way that was very unlike marble. All these defects made her look lively, as anything living in ignorance of perfection looks lively. She was grown up in her thirties, as I now realise, and not a nude, simply a completely naked woman. Although that wasn't the most striking thing. The woman was looking straight at the viewer. That is, at the camera. That is, at me. Her stare had such intensity, it was utterly unlike the radiantly unfocused gaze of a goddess or a model in an artist's studio. Her gaze had a very direct purpose to it. Between the woman and her witness, something was happening or was going to happen. Strictly speaking, her stare was already that happening. It was the conduit or the corridor, the black hole. Her face was wide, flat with slits for eyes, and there was nothing else in it apart from the intensity of the stare. Her communication was intended for the bearer of the photo. But I had somehow taken his place. And this made the situation both tragic and absurd. It was so very obvious that the lady on the leather sofa unlike the whole of art and the whole of history, which was definitely intended for me and took me into account, didn't have me in mind as a viewer, didn't want me. And I knew with certainty that someone else should have been in my place, someone with a name and a surname, and possibly even a moustache. The absence of this other viewer made the whole thing feel indecent, coitus interruptus at its most basic sense, and I was the one interrupting. I'd turned up at the wrong time, and in the wrong place, and I'd witnessed what I shouldn't have witnessed. Sex. The sex was not in the body, or the pose, or even the surroundings, although I remember them well. It was in the directness of the gaze. Its lack of ambiguity. The way it paid no attention to anything beyond the scene. Strange when you think that even 30 years ago both participants were probably dead, and most certainly are now. They have died and left the sex act orphaned in an empty room. 